Section 8 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. The History of Jack and the Giants. In the reign of King Arthur, near to the land's end of England, in the county of Cornwall, lived a wealthy farmer who had a son named Jack. He was brisk and of a ready wit, so that whatever he could not perform by force and strength, he completed by wit and policy. Never was any person heard of that could worst him. Nay, the very learned many times he has baffled by his cunning and sharp inventions. In those days the Mount of Cornwall was kept by a large and monstrous giant of eighteen feet high, and about three yards in circumference, of a fierce and grim countenance, the terror of the neighboring towns and villages. His habitation was in a cave in the midst of the mount, never would he suffer any living creature to keep near him his feeding was on other men's cattle which often became his prey for whenever he wanted food he would wade over to the mainland where he would well furnish himself with whatever he could find for the people at his approach would all forsake their habitations then would he seize upon their cows and oxen of which he would think nothing to carry over upon his back half a dozen at one time and as for their sheep and boys he would tie them round his waist like a bunch of candles this he practised for many years so that a great part of the county of cornwall was very much impoverished by him jack having undertaken to destroy this voracious monster he furnished himself with a horn a shovel and a pickaxe and over to the mount he went in the beginning of a dark winter's evening where he fell to work and before morning had dug a pit twenty-two feet deep and in width nearly the same and covering it over with sticks and straw and then strewing a little mould over it it appeared like plain ground then putting his horn to his mouth he blew tantivy tantivy which noise awoke the giant who came roaring towards jack crying out you incorrigible villain you shall pay dearly for disturbing me for i will broil you for my breakfast these words were no sooner spoke but he tumbled headlong into the pit and the heavy fall made the foundation of the mount to shake oh mr giant where are you now oh faith you are gotten into lob's pound where i will surely plague you for your threatening words what do you think now of broiling me for your breakfast will no other diet serve you but poor jack having thus spoken and made merry with him a while he struck him such a blow on the crown with his pole-axe that he tumbled down and with a groan expired this done jack threw the dirt in upon him and so buried him then searching the cave he found much treasure now when the magistrates who employed jack heard that the job was over they sent for him declaring that he should be henceforth called jack the giant killer and in honour thereof presented him with a sword and an embroidered belt upon which these words were written in letters of gold here's the valiant cornish man who slew the giant cormoran the news of jack's victory was soon spread over the western parts so that another giant called old blunderbore hearing of it vowed to be revenged on jack if it ever was his fortune to light on him the giant kept an enchanted castle 
situated in the midst of a lonesome wood about four months after as jack was walking by the borders of this wood on his journey towards wales he grew weary and therefore sat himself down by the side of a pleasant fountain when a deep sleep suddenly seized him at this time the giant coming there for water found him and by the lines upon his belt immediately knew him to be jack who had killed his brother giant so without any words he took him upon his shoulder to carry him to his enchanted castle as he passed through a thicket the jostling of the boughs awoke jack who finding himself in the clutches of the giant was very much surprised though it was but the beginning of his terrors for entering the walls of the castle he found the floor strewn and the walls covered with the skulls and bones of dead men when the giant told him his bones should enlarge the number of what he saw he also told him that the next day he would eat him with pepper and vinegar and he did not question but that he would find him a curious breakfast this said he locks up poor jack in an upper room leaving him there while he went out to fetch another giant who lived in the same wood that he also might partake of the pleasure they should have in the destruction of honest jack while he was gone dreadful shrieks and cries affrighted jack especially a voice which continually cried do what you can to get away or you'll become the giant's prey he's gone to fetch his brother who will likewise kill and torture you this dreadful noise so affrighted poor jack that he was ready to run distracted then going to a window he opened the casement and beheld afar off the two giants coming so now quoth jack to himself my death or deliverance is at hand there were two strong cords in the room by him at the end of which he made a noose and as the giants were unlocking the iron gates he threw the ropes over the giants heads and then threw the other end across a beam when he pulled with all his might till he had throttled them then fastening the ropes to a beam he returned to the window where he beheld the two giants black in the face and so sliding down the ropes he came upon the heads of the helpless giants who could not defend themselves and drawing his own sword he slew them both and so delivered himself from their intended cruelty then taking the bunch of keys he entered the castle where upon strict search he found three ladies tied up by the hair of their heads and almost starved to death sweet ladies said jack i have destroyed the monster and his brutish brother by which means i have obtained your liberties this said he presented them with the keys of the castle and proceeded on his journey to wales jack having got but little money thought it prudent to make the best of his way by travelling hard and at length losing his road he was benighted and could not get a place of entertainment till coming to a valley between two hills he found a large house in a lonesome place and by reason of his present necessity he took courage to knock at the gate to his amazement there came forth a monstrous giant having two heads yet he did not seem so fiery as the other two for he was a welsh giant and all he did was by private and secret malice under the false show of friendship jack telling his condition he bid him welcome showing him into a room with a bed where he might take his night's repose upon this jack undressed himself 
but as the giant was walking to another apartment jack heard him mutter these words to himself though here you lodge with me this night you shall not see the morning light my club shall dash your brains out quite say you so says jack is this one of your welsh tricks i hope to be as cunning as you then getting out of bed and feeling about the room in the dark he found a thick billet of wood and laid it in the bed in his stead then he hid himself in a dark corner of the room in the dead time of the night came the giant with his club and he struck several blows on the bed where jack had artfully laid the billet then the giant returned back to his own room supposing he had broken all his bones early in the morning jack came to thank him for his lodging oh said the giant how have you rested did you see anything in the night no said jack but a rat gave me three or four slaps with his tail soon after the giant went to breakfast on a great bowl of hasty pudding giving jack but a small quantity jack being loath to let him know he could not eat with him got a leather bag and putting it artfully under his coat put the pudding into it then he told the giant he would show him a trick and taking up a knife he ripped open the bag and out fell the pudding the giant thought he had cut open his stomach and taken the pudding out odd splutters says he her can do that herself and taking the knife up he cut himself so badly that he fell down and died thus jack outwitted the welsh giant and proceeded on his journey king arthur's only son desired his father to furnish him with a certain sum of money that he might go and seek his fortune in the principality of wales where a beautiful lady lived whom he had heard was possessed with seven evil spirits the king his father counselled him against it yet he could not be persuaded so the favour was granted which was one horse loaded with money and another to ride on thus he went forth without any attendance and after several days travel he came to a large market town in wales where he beheld a vast crowd of people gathered together the king's son demanded the reason of it and was told that they had arrested a corpse for many large sums of money which the deceased owed before he died the king's son replied it is a pity that creditors should be so cruel go bury the dead and let the creditors come to my lodgings and their debts shall be discharged accordingly they came and in such great numbers that before night he had almost left himself penniless now jack the giant killer being there and seeing the generosity of the king's son desired to be his servant it being agreed on the next morning they set forward as they were riding out of the town's end an old woman cried out he has owed me twopence seven years pray sir pay me as well as the rest the king's son put his hand in his pocket and gave it her it being the last money he had then turning to jack he said take no thought nor heed let me alone and i warrant you we will never want now jack had a small spell in his pocket the which served for a refreshment after which they had but one penny left between them they spent the forenoon in travel and familiar discourse until the sun grew low when the king's son said jack since we have got no money where can we lodge to-night jack replied master we will do well enough for i have an uncle who lives within two miles of this place 
he is a huge and monstrous giant having three heads he will beat five hundred men in armor and make them fly before him alas said the king's son what shall we do there he will eat us up at a mouthful nay we are scarce sufficient to fill one hollow tooth it is no matter for that says jack i myself will go before and prepare the way for you tarry here and wait my return he waited and jack rode full speed coming to the castle gate he immediately began to knock with such force that all the neighboring hills resounded the giant roaring with a voice like thunder called who is there none but your poor cousin jack and what news said he with my cousin jack he replied dear uncle heavy news god what privy what heavy news can come to me i am a giant with three heads and besides thou knowest i fight five hundred men in armor and make them all fly like chaff before the wind oh said jack but here is a king's son coming with a thousand men in armor to kill you and to destroy all you have oh my cousin jack this is heavy news indeed but i have a large vault underground where i will run and hide myself and you shall lock bolt and bar me in and keep the keys till the king's son is gone jack having now secured the giant returned and fetched his master and both made merry with the best dainties the house afforded in the morning jack furnished his master with fresh supplies of gold and silver and having set him three miles on the road out of the giant's smell he returned and let his uncle out of the hole who asked jack what he should give him for his care of him seeing his castle was demolished why said jack i desire nothing but your old rusty sword the coat in the closet and the cap and the shoes at your bed's head ay said the giant thou shalt have them and be sure keep you them for my sake they are things of excellent use the coat will keep you invisible the cap will furnish you with knowledge the sword cuts asunder whatever you strike and the shoes are of extraordinary swiftness they may be serviceable to you so take them with all my heart jack took them and immediately followed his master having overtaken him they soon arrived at the lady's dwelling who finding the king's son to be a suitor prepared a banquet for him which being ended she wiped her mouth with a handkerchief saying you must show me this to-morrow morning or lose your head and then she put it in her bosom the king's son went to bed right sorrowful but jack's cap of knowledge instructed him how to obtain the handkerchief in the midst of the night the lady called upon her familiar to carry her to lucifer jack whipped on his coat of darkness with his shoes of swiftness and was there before her but could not be seen by reason of his coat which rendered him perfectly invisible to lucifer himself when the lady came she gave him the handkerchief from whom jack took it and brought it to his master who showing it the next morning to the lady saved his life this much surprised the lady but he had yet a harder trial to undergo the next night the lady salutes the king's son telling him he must show her the next day the lips she kissed last or lose his head so i will replied he if you kiss none but mine it is neither here nor there for that says she if you do not death is your portion at midnight she went again and chid lucifer for letting the handkerchief go but now said she i shall be too hard for the king's son 
for i will kiss thee and he is to show me the lips i kissed last and he can never show me thy lips jack standing up with his sword of sharpness cut off the evil spirit's head and brought it under his invisible coat to his master who laid it at the end of his bolster and in the morning when the lady came up he pulled it out and showed her the lips which she kissed last thus she having been answered twice the enchantment broke and the evil spirit left her to their mutual joy and satisfaction then she appeared her former self both beauteous and virtuous they were married the next morning and soon after returned with joy to the court of king arthur where jack for his good services was made one of the knights of the round table jack having been successful in all his undertakings and resolved not to be idle for the future but to perform what service he could for the honour of his king and country humbly requested of the king his royal master to fit him with a horse and money to travel in search of strange and new adventures for said he there are many giants yet living in the remote parts of the kingdom and in the dominions of wales to the unspeakable damage of your majesty's liege subjects wherefore may it please your majesty to give me encouragement and i doubt not but in a short time to cut them all off root and branch and so rid the realm of those cruel giants and devouring monsters in nature now when the king had heard these noble propositions and had duly considered the mischievous practices of those bloodthirsty giants he immediately granted what honest jack requested and on the first day of march being thoroughly furnished with all necessaries for his progress he took his leave not only of king arthur but likewise of all the trusty and hardy knights belonging to the round table who after much salutation and friendly greeting parted the king and nobles to their courtly palaces and jack the giant killer to the eager pursuit of fortune's favours taking with him the cap of knowledge sword of sharpness shoes of swiftness and likewise the invisible coat the latter to perfect and complete the dangerous enterprises that lay before him he travelled over vast hills and wonderful mountains till at the end of three days he came to a large and spacious wood through which he must needs pass where on a sudden to his great amazement he heard dreadful shrieks and cries casting his eyes around to observe what it might be he beheld with wonder a giant rushing along with a worthy knight and his fair lady whom he held by the hair of their heads in his hand with as much ease as if they had been but a pair of gloves the sight of which melted honest jack into tears of pity and compassion alighting off his horse which he left tied to an oak tree and then putting on his invisible coat under which he carried his sword of sharpness he came up to the giant and though he made several passes at him yet nevertheless he could not reach the trunk of his body by reason of his height though he wounded his thighs in several places at length giving him a swinging stroke he cut off both his legs just below the knees so that the trunk of his body made not only the ground to shake but likewise the trees to tremble with the force of its fall at which by mere fortune the knight and his lady escaped his rage then had jack time to talk with him and setting his foot upon his neck he said thou savage and barbarous wretch i am come to execute upon you the just reward of your villainy and with that running him through and through the monster sent forth a hideous groan and yielded up his life into the hands of the valiant conqueror jack the giant killer 
while the noble knight and virtuous lady were both joyful spectators of his sudden downfall and their deliverance this being done the courteous knight and his fair lady not only returned jack hearty thanks for their deliverance but also invited him home there to refresh himself after the dreadful encounter as likewise to receive some ample reward by way of gratuity for his good service no quoth jack i cannot be at ease till i find out the den which was this monster's habitation the knight hearing this waxed right sorrowful and replied noble stranger it is too much to run a second risk for note this monster lived in a den under yon mountain with a brother of his more fierce and fiery than himself therefore if you should go thither and perish in that attempt it would be the heart-breaking of both me and my lady therefore let me persuade you to go with us and desist from any further pursuit nay quoth jack if there be another nay were there twenty i would shed the last drop of blood in my body before one of them should escape my fury when i have finished this task i will come and pay my respects to you so having taken the directions to their habitation he mounted his horse leaving them to return home while he went in pursuit of the deceased giant's brother he had not ridden past a mile and a half before he came in sight of the cave's mouth near to the entrance of which he beheld the other giant sitting upon a huge block of timber with a knotted iron club lying by his side waiting as jack supposed for his brother's return his goggle eyes appeared like terrible flames of fire his countenance was grim and ugly his cheeks being like a couple of large fat flitches of bacon moreover the bristles of his beard seemed to resemble rods of iron wire his locks hung down upon his broad shoulders like curled snakes or hissing adders jack alighted from his horse and put him into a thicket then with his coat of darkness he came somewhat nearer to behold this figure and said softly oh are you there it will be not long ere i shall take you by the beard the giant all this time could not see him by reason of his invisible coat so coming up close to him valiant jack fetching a blow at his head with his sword of sharpness and missing something of his arm cut off the giant's nose the pain was terrible and so he put up his hands to feel for his nose and when he could not find it he raved and roared louder than claps of thunder though he turned up his large eyes he could not see from whence the blow came which had done him that great disaster yet nevertheless he took up his iron knotted club and began to lay about him like one that was stark staring mad nay quoth jack if you are for that sport then i will dispatch you quickly for i fear an accidental blow should fall on me then as the giant rose from his block jack makes no more to do but runs the sword up to the hilt in his body where he left it sticking for a while and stood himself laughing with his hands akimbo to see the giant caper and dance crying out the giant continued raving for an hour or more and at length fell down dead whose dreadful fall had like to have crushed poor jack had he not been nimble to avoid the same this being done jack cut off both the giant's heads and sent them to king arthur by a wagoner whom he hired for the purpose together with an account of his prosperous success in all his undertakings jack having thus dispatched these monsters resolved with himself to enter the cave in search of these giants treasure 
he passed along through many turnings and windings which led him at length to a room paved with freestone at the upper end of which was a boiling cauldron on the right hand stood a large table where as he supposed the giants used to dine he came to an iron gate where was a window secured with bars of iron through which he looked and there beheld a vast many miserable captives who seeing jack at a distance cried out with a loud voice alas young man art thou come to be one amongst us in this miserable den ay quoth jack i hope i shall not tarry long here but pray tell me what is the meaning of your captivity why said one young man i'll tell you we are persons that have been taken by the giants that keep this cave and here we are kept till such time as they have occasion for a particular feast and then the fattest amongst us is slaughtered and prepared for their devouring jaws it is not long since they took three for the same purpose say you so quoth jack well i have given them both such a dinner that it will be long enough ere they'll have occasion for any more the miserable captives were amazed at his words you may believe me quoth jack for i have slain them with the point of my sword and as for their monstrous heads i sent them in a wagon to the court of king arthur as trophies of my unparalleled victory for a testimony of the truth he had said he unlocked the iron gate setting the miserable captives at liberty who all rejoiced like condemned malefactors at the sight of a reprieve then leading them all together to the aforesaid room he placed them round the table and set before them two quarters of beef as also bread and wine so that he feasted them very plentifully supper being ended they searched the giant's coffers where finding a vast store of gold and silver jack equally divided it among them they all returned him hearty thanks for their treasure and miraculous deliverance that night they went to their rest and in the morning they arose and departed the captives to their respective towns and places of abode and jack to the house of the knight whom he had formerly delivered from the hand of the giant it was about sunrising when jack mounted his horse to proceed on his journey and by the help of his directions he came to the knight's house some time before noon where he was received with all demonstrations of joy imaginable by the knight and his lady who in honourable respect to jack prepared a feast which lasted for many days inviting all the gentry in the adjacent parts to whom the worthy knight was pleased to relate the manner of his former danger and the happy deliverance by the undaunted courage of jack the giant killer by way of gratitude he presented jack with a ring of gold on which was engraved by curious art the picture of the giant dragging a distressed knight and his fair lady by the hair of the head with this motto we are in sad distress you see under a giant's fierce command but gained our lives and liberty by valiant jack's victorious hand now among the vast assembly there present were five aged gentlemen who were fathers to some of those miserable captives which jack had lately set at liberty who understanding that he was the person that performed those great wonders immediately paid their venerable respects after this their mirth increased and the smiling bowls went freely round to the prosperous success of the victorious conqueror but in the midst of all this mirth a dark cloud appeared which daunted all the hearts of the honourable assembly thus it was a messenger brought the dismal tidings of the approach of one thunderdell a huge giant with two heads who having heard of the death of his kinsmen the above-named giants 
was come from the northern dales in search of jack to be revenged of him for their most miserable downfall he was now within a mile of the knight's seat the country people flying before him from their houses and habitations like chaff before the wind when they had related this jack not a whit daunted said let him come i am prepared with a tool to pick his teeth and you gentlemen and ladies walk but forth into the garden and you shall be the joyful spectators of this monstrous giant's death and destruction to which they consented every one wishing him good fortune in that great and dangerous enterprise the situation of this knight's house take as follows it was placed in the midst of a small island encompassed round with a vast moat thirty feet deep and twenty feet wide over which lay a drawbridge jack employed two men to cut this last on both sides almost to the middle and then dressing himself in his coat of darkness likewise putting on his shoes of swiftness he marches forth against the giant with his sword of sharpness ready drawn when he came up to him yet the giant could not see jack by reason of his invisible coat which he had on yet nevertheless he was sensible of some approaching danger which made him cry out in these following words fee fi fo fum i smell the blood of an englishman be he alive or be he dead i'll grind his bones to make me bread sayest thou so quoth jack then thou art a monstrous miller indeed but what if i serve thee as i did the two giants of late on my conscience i should spoil your practice for the future at which time the giant spoke in a voice as loud as thunder art thou that villain which destroyed my kinsmen then will i tear thee with my teeth and what is more i will grind thy bones to powder you will catch me first sir quoth jack and with that he threw off his coat of darkness that the giant might see him clearly and then ran from him as if through fear the giant with foaming mouth and glaring eyes followed after like a walking castle making the foundation of the earth as it were to shake at every step jack led him a dance three or four times round the moat belonging to the knight's house that the gentlemen and ladies might take a full view of this huge monster of nature who followed jack with all his bite but could not overtake him by reason of his shoes of swiftness which carried him faster than the giant could follow at last jack to finish the work took over the bridge the giant with full speed pursuing after him with his iron club upon his shoulder but coming to the middle of the drawbridge what with the weight of his body and the most dreadful steps that he took it broke down and he tumbled full into the water where he rolled and wallowed like a whale jack standing at the side of the moat laughed at the giant and said you told me you would grind my bones to powder here you have water enough pray where is your mill the giant fretted and foamed to hear him scoff at that rate and though he plunged from place to place in the moat yet he could not get out to be avenged on his adversary jack at length got a cast rope and cast it over the giant's two heads with a slipknot and by the help of a train of horses dragged him out again with which the giant was nearly strangled and before jack would let him loose he cut off both his heads with his sword of sharpness in the full view of all the worthy assembly of knights gentlemen and ladies who gave a joyful shout when they saw the giant fairly dispatched then before he would either eat or drink jack sent the heads also after the others to the court of king arthur which being done he with the knights and ladies returned to their mirth and pastime which lasted for many days after some time spent 
in triumphant mirth and pastime jack grew weary of riotous living wherefore taking leave of the noble knights and ladies he set forward in search of new adventures through many woods and groves he passed meeting with nothing remarkable till at length coming near the foot of a high mountain late at night he knocked at the door of a lonesome house at which time an ancient man with a head as white as snow arose and let him in father said jack have you any entertainment for a benighted traveller that has lost his way yes said the old man if you will accept of such accommodation as my poor cottage will afford thou shalt be right welcome jack returned him many thanks for his great civility wherefore down they sat together and the old man began to discourse him as follows son said he i am sensible thou art the great conqueror of giants and it is in thy power to free this part of the country from an intolerable burden which we groan under for behold my son on the top of this high mountain there is an enchanted castle kept by a huge monstrous giant named galagantus who by the help of an old conjurer betrays many knights and ladies into this strong castle where by magic art they are transformed into sundry shapes and forms but above all i lament the fate of a duke's daughter whom they snatched from her father's garden by magic art carrying her through the air in a mourning chariot drawn as it were by two fiery dragons and being secured within the walls of the castle she was immediately transformed into the real shape of a white hind where she miserably moans her misfortune though many worthy knights have endeavoured to break the enchantment and work her deliverance yet none of them could accomplish this great work by reason of two dreadful griffins who were fixed by magic art at the entrance of the castle gate which destroy any as soon as they see them you my son being furnished with an invisible coat may pass by them undiscovered and on the brazen gates of the castle you will find engraved in large characters by what means the enchantment may be broken the old man having ended his discourse jack gave him his hand with a faithful promise that in the morning he would venture his life to break the enchantment and free the lady together with the rest that were miserable partners in her calamity having refreshed themselves with a small morsel of meat they laid them down to rest and in the morning jack arose and put on his invisible coat cap of knowledge and shoes of swiftness and so prepares himself for the dangerous enterprises now when he had ascended to the top of the mountain he soon discovered the two fiery griffins he passed on between them without fear for they could not see him by reason of his invisible coat now when he was got beyond them he cast his eyes around him where he found upon the gates a golden trumpet hung in a chain of fine silver under which these lines were engraved whosoever shall this trumpet blow shall soon the giant overthrow and break the black enchantment straight so all shall be in happy state jack had no sooner read this inscription but he blew the trumpet at which time the vast foundation of the castle tumbled and the giant together with the conjurer was in horrid confusion biting their thumbs and tearing their hair knowing their wicked reign was at an end at that time jack standing at the giant's elbow as he was stooping to take up his club at one blow with his sword of sharpness cut off his head the conjurer seeing this immediately mounted into the air and was carried away in a whirlwind thus was the whole enchantment broken and every knight and lady that had been for a long time transformed into birds and beasts returned to their proper shapes and likeness again as for the castle 
though it seemed at first to be of vast strength and bigness it vanished in a cloud of smoke whereupon an universal joy appeared among the released knights and ladies this being done the head of galligantus was likewise according to the accustomed manner conveyed to the court of king arthur as a present made to his majesty the very next day after having refreshed the knights and ladies at the old man's habitation who lived at the foot of the mountain jack set forward for the court of king arthur with those knights and ladies he had so honourably delivered coming to his majesty and having related all the passages of his fierce encounters his fame rang through the whole court and as a reward for his good services the king prevailed with the aforesaid duke to bestow his daughter in marriage to honest jack protesting that there was no man so worthy of her as he to all which the duke very honourably consented so married they were and not only the court but likewise the kingdom were filled with joy and triumph at the wedding after which the king as a reward for all his good services done for the nation bestowed upon him a noble habitation with a plentiful estate thereto belonging where he and his lady lived the residue of their days in great joy and happiness End of section eight. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section nine of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Folklore and Legends, English By Charles John Tibbets Section 9 The Fairy's Cup In the province of the Dairy, Yorkshire, not far from my birthplace, says William of Newbury, a wonderful thing occurred, which I have known from my boyhood. There is a town a few miles distant from the eastern sea, near which are those celebrated waters commonly called gypsy a peasant of this town went once to see a friend who lived in the next town and it was late at night when he was coming back not very sober when lo from the adjoining barrow which i have often seen and which is not much over a quarter of a mile from the town he heard the voices of people singing and as it were joyfully feasting he wondered who they could be that were breaking in that place by their merriment the silence of the dead night and he wished to examine into the matter more closely seeing a door open in the side of the barrow he went up to it and looked in and there he beheld a large and luminous house full of people women as well as men who were reclining as at a solemn banquet one of the attendants seeing him standing at the door offered him a cup he took it but would not drink and pouring out the contents kept the vessel a great tumult arose at the banquet on account of his taking away the cup and all the guests pursued him but he escaped by the fleetness of the beast he rode and got into the town with his booty finally this vessel of unknown material of unusual colour and of extraordinary form was presented to henry the elder king of the english as a valuable gift was then given to the queen's brother david king of the scots and was kept for several years in the treasury of scotland a few years ago as i have heard from good authority it was given by william king of the scots to henry the second who wished to see it end of section nine Section 10 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma. Folklore and Legends, English. By Charles John Tibbets. The White Lady. There was once on a time an old woman who lived near Heathfield in Devonshire, 
she made a slight mistake i do not know how and got up at midnight thinking it was to be morning this good woman mounted her horse and set off panniers cloak and all on her way to market anon she heard a cry of hounds and soon perceived a hare making rapidly towards her the hare however took a turn and a leap and got on the top of the hedge as if it would say to the old woman come catch me she liked such hunting as this very well put forth her hand secured the game popped it into one of the panniers covered it over and rode forward she had not gone far when great was her alarm at perceiving on the dismal and solitary waste of heathfield advancing at full pace a headless horse bearing a black and grim rider with horns sprouting from under a little jockey cap and having a cloven foot thrust into one stirrup he was surrounded by a pack of hounds which had tails that whisked about and shone like fire while the air itself had a strong sulphurous scent these were signs not to be mistaken and the poor old woman knew in a moment that huntsmen and hounds were taking a ride from the regions below it soon however appeared that however clever the rider might be he was no conjurer for he very civilly asked the old woman if she could set him right and point out which way the hare had flown the old woman probably thought it was no harm to pay the father of lies in his own coin so she boldly gave him a negative and he rode on not suspecting the cheat when he was out of sight the old woman perceived the hare in the pannier began to move and at length to her great amazement it changed into a beautiful young lady all in white who thus addressed her preserver good dame i admire your courage and i thank you for the kindness with which you have saved me from a state of suffering that must not be told to human ears do not start when i tell you that i am not an inhabitant of the earth for a great crime committed during the time i dwelt upon it i was doomed as a punishment in the other world to be constantly pursued either above or below ground by evil spirits until i could get behind their tails whilst they passed on in search of me this difficult object by your means i have now happily effected and as a reward for your kindness i promise that all your hens shall lay two eggs instead of one and that your cows shall yield the most plentiful store of milk all the year round that you shall talk twice as much as you ever did before and your husband stand no chance in any matter between you to be settled by the tongue but beware of the devil and don't grumble about tithes for my enemy and yours may do you an ill turn when he finds out that you were clever enough to cheat him since like all great impostors he does not like to be cheated himself he can assume all shapes except those of the lamb and dove the lady in white then vanished the old woman found the best possible luck that morning in her traffic and to this day the story goes in the town that from the saviour of the world having hallowed the form of the lamb and the holy ghost that of the dove they can never be assumed by the mortal enemy of the human race under any circumstances. End of section 10 Section 11 of Folklore and Legends, English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbets. A Pleasant and Delightful History of Thomas Hickthrift In the reign before William the Conqueror, I have read in an ancient history that there dwelt a man in the parish of the Isle of Ely, in the county of Cambridge, whose name was Thomas Hickathrift, a poor man and a day labourer. Yet he was a very stout man, and able to perform two days' work instead of one. He having one son and no more children in the world, he called him by his own name, Thomas Hickathrift. This old man put his son to good learning, but he would take none, for he was, as we call them in this age, none of the wisest sort but something less 
and had no docility at all in him his father being soon called out of the world his mother was tender of him and maintained him by her hand labor as well as she could he being slothful and not willing to work to get a penny for his living but all his delight was to be in the chimney corner and he would eat as much at one time as would serve four or five men he was in height when he was but ten years of age about eight feet and in thickness five feet and his hand was like unto a shoulder of mutton and in all his parts from top to toe he was like unto a monster and yet his great strength was not known the first time that his strength was known was by his mother's going to a rich farmer's house she being but a poor woman to desire a bottle of straw for herself and her son thomas the farmer being a very honest charitable man bid her take what she would she going home to her son tom said i pray go to such a place and fetch me a bottle of straw i have asked him leave he swore he would not go nay prithee tom go said his mother he swore again he would not go unless she would borrow him a cart rope she being willing to please him because she would have some straw went and borrowed him a cart rope to his desire he taking it went his way coming to the farmer's house the master was in the barn and two men a thrashing said tom i am come for a bottle of straw tom said the master take as much as thou canst carry he laid down the cart rope and began to make his bottle said they tom thy rope is too short and jeered poor tom but he fitted the man well for it for he made his bottle and when he had finished it there was supposed to be a load of straw in it of two thousand pounds weight said they what a great fool art thou thou canst not carry the tenth of it tom took the bottle and flung it over his shoulder and made no more of it than we would do of a hundredweight to the great admiration of master and man tom hickathrift's strength being then known in the town they would no longer let him lie baking by the fire in the chimney corner every one would be hiring him for work they seeing him to have so much strength told him that it was a shame for him to live such a lazy course of life and to be idle day after day as he did tom seeing them bait him in such a manner as they did went first to one work and then to another but at length came to a man who would hire him to go to the wood for he had a tree to bring home and he would content him tom went with him and took with him four men besides but when they came to the wood they set the cart to the tree and began to draw it up with pulleys tom seeing them not able to stir it said stand away ye fools then takes it up and sets it on one end and lays it in the cart now says he see what a man can do barry it is true said they when they had done as they came through the wood they met the woodman tom asked him for a stick to make his mother a fire with i says the woodman take one that thou canst carry tom espied a tree bigger than that one that was in the cart and lays it on his shoulder and goes home with it as fast as the cart and the six horses could draw it this was the second time that tom's strength was known when tom began to know that he had more strength than twenty men he then began to be merry and very tractable and would run or jump took great delight to be amongst company and to go to fairs and meetings to see sports and pastimes going to a feast the young men were all met some to cudgels some to wrestling some throwing the hammer and the like 
tom stood a little to see the sport and at last goes to them that were throwing the hammer standing a little to see their manlike sport at last he takes the hammer in his hand to feel the weight of it and bid them stand out of the way for he would throw it as far as he could ay said the smith and jeered poor tom you'll throw it a great way i'll warrant you tom took the hammer in his hand and flung it and there was a river about five or six furlongs off and he flung it into that when he had done he bid the smith fetch the hammer and laughed the smith to scorn when tom had done this exploit he would go to wrestling though he had no more skill of it than an ass but what he did by strength yet he flung all that came to oppose him for if he once laid hold of them they were gone some he would throw over his head some he would lay down slyly and how he pleased he would not like to strike at their heels but flung them two or three yards from him ready to break their necks asunder so that none at last durst go into the ring to wrestle with him for they took him to be some devil that was come among them so tom's fame spread more and more in the country tom's fame being spread abroad both far and near there was not a man durst give him an angry word for he was something foolhardy and did not care what he did unto them so that all they that knew him would not in the least displease him at length there was a brewer at lynn that wanted a good lusty man to carry his beer to the marsh and to wispeach hearing of tom went to hire him but tom seemed coy and would not be his man until his mother and friends persuaded him and his master entreated him he likewise promised him that he should have a new suit of clothes and everything answerable from top to toe besides he should eat of the best tom at last yielded to be his man and his master told him how far he must go for you must understand there was a monstrous giant kept some part of the marsh and none durst go that way for if they did he would keep them or kill them or else he would make bond slaves of them but to come to tom and his master he did more work in one day than all his men could do in three so that his master seeing him very tractable and to look well after his business made him his head man to go into the marsh to carry beer by himself for he needed no man with him tom went every day in the week to wispeach which was a very good journey and it was twenty miles the roadway tom going so long that wearisome journey and finding that way the giant kept was nearer by half and tom having now got much more strength than before by being so well kept and drinking so much strong ale as he did one day as he was going to wisbeach and not saying anything to his master or to any of his fellow servants he was resolved to make the nearest way to the wood or lose his life to win the horse or lose the saddle to kill or be killed if he met with the giant and with this resolution he goes the nearest way with his cart and horses to go to wispeach but the giant perceiving him and seeing him to be bold thought to prevent him and came intending to take his cart for a prize but he cared not a bit for him the giant met tom like a lion as though he would have swallowed him up at a mouthful sirrah said he who gave you authority to come this way do you not know i make all stand in fear of my sight and you like an impudent rogue must come and fling my gates open at your pleasure how dare you presume to do this are you so careless of your life i will make thee an example for all rogues under the sun dost thou not care what thou dost 
do you see how many heads hang upon yonder tree that have offended my law thy head shall hang higher than all the rest for an example tom made him answer a fig for your news for you shall not find me like one of them no said the giant why thou art but a fool if thou comest to fight with such a one as i am and bring no weapon to defend thyself withal said tom i have a weapon here will make you understand you are a traitorly rogue ay sirrah said the giant and took that word in high disdain that tom should call him a traitorly rogue and with that he ran into his cave to fetch out his club intending to dash out tom's brains at the first blow tom knew not what to do for a weapon for he knew his whip would do but little good against such a monstrous beast as he was for he was in height about twelve feet and six about the waist while the giant went for his club tom bethought himself of two very good weapons for he makes no more ado but takes his cart and turns it upside down takes out the axle tree and a wheel for his shield and buckler and very good weapons they were especially in time of need the giant coming out again began to stare at tom to see him take the wheel in one hand and the axle tree in the other to defend him with oh said the giant you are like to do great service with these weapons i have here a twig that will beat thee and thy wheel and axle tree to the ground that which the giant called a twig was as thick as some mill posts are but tom was not daunted for his big and threatening speech for he perfectly saw there was no way except one which was to kill or be killed so the giant made at tom with such a vehement force that he made tom's wheel crack again and tom let the giant as good for he took him such a weighty blow on the side of his head that he made the giant reel again what said tom are you drunk with my strong beer already the giant recovering laid on tom but still as they came tom kept them off with his wheel so that he had no hurt at all in short tom plied his work so well and laid such huge blows on the giant that sweat and blood together ran down his face and being fat and foggy with fighting so long he was almost tired out and he asked tom to let him drink a little water and then he would fight him again no said tom my mother did not teach me that wit who would be the fool then tom seeing the giant began to grow weary and that he failed in his blows thought it was best to make hay while the sun did shine for he laid on so fast as though he had been mad till he brought the giant down to the ground the giant seeing himself down and tom laying so hard on him made him roar in a most lamentable manner and prayed him not to take away his life and he would do anything for him and yield himself to him to be his servant but tom having no more mercy on him than a dog or a bear laid still on the giant till he laid him for dead when he had done he cut off his head and went into his cave where he found great store of gold and silver which made his heart leap now having done this action in killing the giant he put his cart together again loaded it and drove it to wisbeach and delivered his beer and coming home to his master he told it to him his master was so overjoyed at the news that he would not believe him till he had seen and getting up the next day he and his master went to see if he spoke the truth or not together with most of the town of lynn 
when they came to the place and found the giant dead he then showed the place where the head was and what silver and gold there was in the cave all of them leaped for joy for this monster was a great enemy to all the country this news was spread all up and down the country how tom hickathrift had killed the giant and well was he that could run or go to see the giant and his cave then all the folks made bonfires for joy and tom was a better respected man than before tom took possession of the giant's cave by consent of the whole country and every one said he deserved twice as much more tom pulled down the cave and built him a fine house where the cave stood and in the ground that the giant kept by force and strength some of which he gave to the poor for their common the rest he made pastures of and divided the most part into tillage to maintain him and his mother jane hickathrift tom's fame was spread both far and near throughout the country and it was no longer tom but mr hickathrift so that he was now the chiefest man among them for the people feared tom's anger as much as they did the giant before tom kept men and maid servants and lived most bravely he made a park to keep deer in near to his house he built a church and gave it the name of st james's church because he killed the giant on that day which is so called to this hour he did many good deeds and became a public benefactor to all persons that lived near him tom having got so much money about him and being not used to it could hardly tell how to dispose of it but yet he did use the means to do it for he kept a pack of hounds and men to hunt with him and who but tom then so he took such delight in sports that he would go far and near to any meetings as cudgel play bear baiting football and the like now as tom was riding one day he alighted off his horse to see that sport for they were playing for a wager tom was a stranger and none did know him there but tom spoiled their sport for he meeting the football took it such a kick that they never found their ball more they could see it fly but whither none could tell they all wondered at it and began to quarrel with tom but some of them got nothing by it for tom gets a great spar which belonged to a house that was blown down and all that stood in his way he knocked down so that all the county was up in arms to take tom but all in vain for he manfully made way wherever he came when he was gone from them and returning homewards he chanced to be somewhat late in the evening on the road there met him four stout lusty rogues that had been robbing passengers that way and none could escape them for they robbed all they met both rich and poor they thought when they met with tom he would be a good prize for them and perceiving he was alone made cocksure of his money but they were mistaken for he got a prize by them whereupon meeting him they bid him stand and deliver what said tom shall i deliver your money sirrah said they but said tom you will give me better words for it and you must be better armed come come said they we do not come here to parley but we come for money and money we will have before we stir from this place ay said tom is it so then get it and take it so then one of them made at him but he presently unarmed him and took away his sword which was made of good trusty steel and smote so hard at the others that they began to put spurs to their horses and be gone but he soon stayed their journey for one of them having a portmanteau behind him tom supposing there was money in it 
fought with a great deal of more courage than before till at last he killed two of the four and the other two he wounded very sore so that they cried out for quarter with much ado he gave them their lives but took all their money which was about two hundred pounds to bear his expenses home now when tom came home he told them how he had served the football players and the four highwaymen which caused a laughter from his old mother then refreshing himself he went to see how all things were and what his men had done since he went from home then going into his forest he walked up and down and at last met with a lusty tinker that had a good staff on his shoulder and a great dog to carry his leather bag and tools of work tom asked the tinker from whence he came and whither he was going for that was no highway the tinker being a sturdy fellow bid him go look and what was that to him for fools would be meddling no says tom but i'll make you know before you and i part it is me ay said the tinker i have been this three long years and have had no combat with any man and none durst make me an answer i think they be all cowards in this country except it be a man who is called thomas hickathrift who killed a giant him i would fain see to have one combat with him ay said tom but methinks i might be master in your mouth i am the man what have you to say to me why said the tinker verily i am glad we have met so happily together that we may have one single combat sure said tom you do but jest marry said the tinker i am in earnest a match said tom will you give me leave to get a twig ay says the tinker hang him that will fight a man unarmed i scorn that tom steps to the gate and takes one of the rails for his staff so they fell to work the tinker at tom and tom at the tinker like unto two giants they laid one at the other the tinker had on a leathern coat and at every blow tom gave the tinker his coat cracked again yet the tinker did not give way to tom an inch but tom gave the tinker a blow on the side of the head which felled the tinker to the ground now tinker where are you said tom but the tinker being a man of metal leaped up again and gave tom a blow which made him reel again and followed his blows and then took tom on the other side which made tom's neck crack again tom flung down the weapon and yielded the tinker to be the best man and took him home to his house where i shall leave tom and the tinker to be recovered of their many wounds and bruises which relation is more enlarged as you may read in the second part of thomas hickathrift in and about the isle of ely many disaffected persons to the number of ten thousand and upwards drew themselves up in a body presuming to contend for their pretended ancient rights and liberties insomuch that the gentry and civil magistrates of the country were in great danger at which time the sheriff by night privately got into the house of thomas hickathrift as a secure place of refuge in so imminent a time of danger where before thomas hickathrift he laid open the villainous intent of this headstrong giddy-brained multitude mr sheriff quoth tom what service my brother meaning the tinker and i can perform shall not be wanting this said in the morning by daybreak with trusty clubs they both went forth desiring the sheriff to be their guide in conducting them to the place of the rebels rendezvous when they came there tom and the tinker marched up to the head of the multitude and demanded of them the reason why they disturbed the government to which they answered with a loud cry 
our wills our law and by that alone we will be governed nay quoth tom if it be so these trusty clubs are our weapons and by them you shall be chastised which words were no sooner out of his mouth than the tinker and he put themselves both together in the midst of the throng and with their clubs beat the multitude down trampling them under their feet every blow which they struck laid twenty or thirty before them nay remarkable it was the tinker struck a tall man just upon the nape of the neck with that force that his head flew off and was carried violently fourteen feet from him where it knocked down one of their chief ringleaders tom on the other hand still pressing forward till by an unfortunate blow he broke his club yet he was not in the least dismayed for he presently seized upon a lusty stout raw-boned miller and made use of him for a weapon till at length they cleared the field so that there was not found one that dare lift up a hand against them having run to holes and corners to hide themselves shortly after some of their heads were taken and made public examples of justice the rest being pardoned at the humble request of thomas hickathrift and the tinker the king being truly informed of the faithful services performed by these his loving subjects thomas hickathrift and the tinker he was pleased to send for them to his palace where a royal banquet was prepared for their entertainment most of the nobility being present now after the banquet was over the king said unto all that were there these are my trusty and well-beloved subjects men of approved courage and valour they are the men that overcame and conquered ten thousand which were got together to disturb the peace of my realm according to the character that hath been given to thomas hickathrift and henry nonsuch persons here present they cannot be matched in any other kingdom in the world were it possible to have an army of twenty thousand such as these i dare venture to act the part of alexander the great over again yet in the meanwhile as a proof of my royal favour kneel down and receive the ancient order of knighthood mr hickathrift which was instantly performed and as for henry nonsuch i will settle upon him as a reward for his great service the sum of forty shillings a year during life which said the king withdrew and sir thomas hickathrift and henry nonsuch the tinker returned home attended by many persons of quality some miles from the court but to the great grief of sir thomas at his return from the court he found his aged mother drawing to her end who in a few days after died and was buried in the isle of ely tom's mother being dead and he left alone in a large and spacious house he found himself strange and uncouth therefore he began to consider with himself that it would not be amiss to seek out for a wife hearing of a young rich widow not far from cambridge to her he went and made his addresses and at the first coming she seemed to show him much favour and countenance but between this and his coming again she had given some entertainment to a more genteel and airy spark who happened likewise to come while honest tom was there the second time he looked wistfully at tom and he stared as wistfully at him again at last the young spark began with abuseful language to affront tom telling him that he was a great lubberly whelp adding that such a one as he should not pretend to make love to a lady as he was but a brewer's servant scoundrel quoth tom better words should become you and if you do not mend your manners you shall not fail to feel my sharp correction at which the young spark challenged him forth into the backyard for as he said he did not question but to make a fool of tom in a trice into the yard they both walked together 
the young spark with a naked sword and tom with neither stick nor staff in his hand nor any other weapon what says the spark have you nothing to defend yourself well i shall the sooner dispatch you which said he ran furiously forward making a pass at tom which he put by and then wheeling round tom gave him such a swinging kick as sent the spark like a crow up into the air from whence he fell upon the ridge of a thatched house and then came down into a large fish-pond and had been certainly drowned if it had not been for a poor shepherd who was walking that way and seeing him float upon the water dragged him out with his hook and home he ran like a drowned rat while tom returned to the lady this young gallant being tormented in his mind to think how tom had conquered and shamed him before his mistress he was now resolved for speedy revenge and knowing that he was not able to cope with a man of tom's strength and activity he therefore hired two lusty troopers to lie in ambush in a thicket which tom was to pass through from his home to the young lady accordingly they attempted to set upon him how now quoth tom rascals what would you be at are you indeed weary of the world that you so unadvisedly set upon one who is able to crush you in like a cucumber the troopers laughing at him said that they were not to be daunted at his high words high words quoth tom no i will come to action and with that he ran in between these armed troopers catching them under his arm horse and men with as much ease as if they had been but a couple of baker's babbins steering his course with them hastily towards his own home as he passed through a meadow in which there were many haymakers at work the poor distressed troopers cried out stop him stop him he runs away with two of the king's troopers the haymakers laughed heartily to see how tom hugged them along ever and anon he upbraided them for their baseness and declared that he would make minced meat of them to feed the crows and jackdaws about his house and habitation this was such a dreadful lecture to them that the poor rogues begged that he would be merciful and spare their lives and they would discover the whole plot and who was the person that employed them this accordingly they did and gained favor in the sight of tom who pardoned them upon promise that they would never be concerned in such a villainous action for the time to come in regard tom had been hindered by these troopers he delayed his visit to his lady till the next day and then coming to her gave her a full account of what had happened she was pleased at heart at this wonderful relation knowing it was safe for a woman to marry with a man who was able to defend her against all assaults whatsoever and such a one she found tom to be the day of marriage was accordingly appointed and friends and relations invited yet secret malice which is never satisfied without sweet revenge had like to have prevented the solemnity for having three miles to go to church where they were to be married the aforesaid gentleman had provided a second time russians in armor to the number of twenty-one he himself being then present either to destroy the life of tom or put them into strange consternation however thus it happened in a lonesome place they rolled out upon them making their first assault upon tom and with a spear gave him a slight wound at which his love and the rest of the women shrieked and cried like persons out of their wits tom endeavoured all that he could to pacify them saying stand you still and i will show you pleasant sport with that he caught a back sword from the side of a gentleman in his own company with which he so bravely behaved himself that at every stroke 
he cut off a joint loath he was to touch the life of any but aiming at their legs and arms he lopped them off so fast that in less than a quarter of an hour there was not one in the company but what had lost a limb the green grass being stained with their purple gore and the ground strewn with the legs and arms as tis with tiles from the tops of the houses after a dreadful storm his love and the rest of the company standing all the while as joyful spectators laughing one at another saying what a company of cripples has he made as it were in the twinkling of an eye yes quoth tom i believe that for every drop of blood that i lost i have made the rascals pay me a limb as a just tribute this done he stepped to a farmer's hard by and hired there a servant giving him twenty shillings to carry these cripples home to their respective habitations in his cart then did he hasten with his love to the church to be married and then returned home where they were heartily merry with their friends after their fierce and dreadful encounter now tom being married he made a plentiful feast to which he invited all the poor widows in four or five parishes for the sake of his mother whom he had lately buried this feast was kept in his own house with all manner of varieties that the country could afford for the space of four days in honour likewise of the four victories which he had lately obtained now when the time of feasting was ended a silver cup was missing and being asked about it they every one denied they knew anything about it at length it was agreed that they should all stand the search which they did and the cup was found on a certain old woman named the widow stumbelow then were all the rest in a rage some were for hanging her others were for chopping the old woman in pieces for her ingratitude to such a generous soul as sir thomas hickathrift but he entreated them all to be quiet saying they should not murder the old woman for he would appoint a punishment for her himself which was this he bored a hole through her nose and tying a string therein then ordered her to be led by the nose through all the streets and lanes in cambridge the tidings of tom's wedding were soon noised in the court so that the king sent them a royal invitation to the end that he might see his lady they immediately went and were received with all demonstrations of joy and triumph but while they were in their mirth a dreadful cry approached the court which proved to be the commons of kent who were come thither to complain of a dreadful giant that was landed in one of the islands and brought with him abundance of bears and young lions likewise a dreadful dragon on which he himself rode which monster and ravenous beasts had frightened all the inhabitants out of the island moreover they said if speedy course was not taken to suppress them in time they might overrun the whole island the king hearing this dreadful relation was a little startled yet he persuaded them to return home and make the best defence they could for themselves at present assuring them that he should not forget them and so they departed the king hearing the aforesaid dreadful tidings immediately sat in council to consider what was to be done for the overcoming this monstrous giant and barbarous savage lions and beasts that with him had invaded his princely territories at length it was agreed upon that thomas hickathrift was the most likely man in the whole kingdom for undertaking of so dangerous an enterprise he being not only a fortunate man of great strength but likewise a true and trusty subject one that was always ready and willing to do his king and country service for which reason it was thought necessary to make him governor of the aforesaid island which place of trust and honour he readily received 
and accordingly he forthwith went down with his wife and family attended by a hundred knights and gentlemen who conducted him to the entrance of the island which he was to govern a castle in those days there was in which he was to take up his headquarters the same being situated with that advantage that he could view the island for several miles upon occasion the knights and gentlemen at last taking their leave of him wished him all happy success and prosperity many days he had not been there when it was his fortune to behold this monstrous giant mounted upon a dreadful dragon bearing upon his shoulder a club of iron having but one eye the which was placed in his forehead and larger in compass than a barber's basin and seemed to appear like a flaming fire his visage was dreadful grim and tawny the hair of his head hanging down his back and shoulders like snakes of a prodigious length the bristles of his beard being like rusty wire lifting up his blare eye he happened to discover sir thomas hickathrift who was looking upon him from one of his windows of the castle the giant then began to knit his brow and breathe forth threatening words to the governor who indeed was a little surprised at the approach of so monstrous a brute the giant finding that tom did not make much haste down to meet him alighted from the back of the dragon and chained the same to an oak tree then marching furiously to the castle he set his broad shoulder against a corner of the stone walls as if he intended to overthrow the whole building at once which tom perceiving said is this the game you would be at faith i shall spoil your sport for i have a delicate tool to pick your teeth withal then taking his two-handed sword of five foot long a weapon which the king had given him to govern with taking this i say down he went and flinging open the gates he there found the giant who by an unfortunate slip in his thrusting was fallen all along where he lay and could not help himself what quoth tom do you come here to take up your lodging this is not to be suffered with that he ran his long broadsword into the giant's body which made the monstrous brute give such a terrible groan that it seemed like roaring thunder making the very neighboring trees to tremble then tom pulling out his sword again at six or seven blows separated his head from his unconscionable trunk which head when it was off seemed like the root of a mighty oak then turning to the dragon which was all this while chained to a tree without any further discourse with four blows with his two-handed sword he cut off his head also this fortunate adventure being over he sent immediately for a team of horses and a wagon which he loaded with these heads then summoning all the constables in the country for a guard he sent them to the court with a promise to his majesty that he would rid the whole island likewise of bears and lions before he left it tom's victories rang so long that they reached the ears of his old acquaintance the tinker who desirous of honour resolved to go down and visit tom in his new government coming there he met with kind and loving entertainment for they were very joyful to see one another now after three or four days enjoyment of one another's company tom told the tinker that he must needs go forth in search after wild bears and lions in order to rout them out of the island well quoth the tinker i would gladly take my fortune with you hoping that i may be serviceable to you upon occasion well quoth tom with all my heart for i must needs acknowledge i shall be right glad of your company this said they both went forward tom with his two-handed sword and the tinker with his long pike staff now after they had travelled about four or five hours 
it was their fortune to light on the whole knot of wild beasts together of which six of them were bears the other eight young lions now when they had fastened their eyes on tom and the tinker these ravenous beasts began to roar and run furiously as if they would have devoured them at a mouthful tom and the tinker stood side by side with their backs against an oak and as the lions and bears came within their reach tom with his long sword clove their heads asunder till they were all destroyed saving one lion who seeing the rest of his fellows slain was endeavouring to escape now the tinker being somewhat too venturous ran too hastily after him and having given the lion one blow he turned upon him again seizing him by the throat with that violence that the poor tinker fell dead to the ground tom hickathrift seeing this gave the lion such a blow that it ended his life now was his joy mingled with sorrow for though he had cleared the island of those ravenous savage beasts yet his grief was intolerable for the loss of his old friend home he returned to his lady where in token of joy for the wonderful success which he had in his dangerous enterprises he made a very noble and splendid feast to which he invited most of his best friends and acquaintances to whom he made the following promise my friends while i have strength to stand most manfully i will pursue all dangers till i clear this land of lions bears and tigers too this you'll find true or i'm to blame let it remain upon record tom hickathrift's most glorious fame who never yet has broke his word the man who does his country bless shall merit much from this fair land he who relieved them in distress his fame upon record shall stand and you my friends who hear me now let honest tom for ever dwell within your minds and thoughts i trow since he has pleased you all so well end of section eleven recording by linda johnson Section 12 of Folklore and Legends, English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legends, English by Charles John Tibbets. The Spectre Coach. Cobblers are a thoughtful race of men and tom shanks was one of their number he lived in the little village of acton in suffolk and it was there that an adventure befell him which as i am informed by a grandson of his had an effect on him from that day to this though the this in the present case is of a somewhat vague meaning seeing that tom has unfortunately been dead some twenty years at least the terrible adventure that befell him was so much the subject of tom's talk that if ever tale could be handed down by means of oral tradition sure tom's story should be intact in every detail it seems that one day tom left acton on a journey quite a remarkable event for him for he was a quiet-going fellow not giving to running away from his last but sitting contentedly in his little shop busily employed in providing his neighbors with good footgear on this day however tom was called away by the intelligence that a sister of his who was in service in a town some little distance away was ill and wished to see him the little cobbler was a man with a warm heart and as soon as he received this ill news he laid aside a pair of shoes he was on for the parson and which he was very anxious to finish for the sooner he touched the money the better for him and his 
put on his best coat took his stick in his hand and having bid farewell to his wife and three little ones went on his way looking back now and then to shake his stick to them till he came to the turn in the road by the side of the high trees when he could see them no more well he walked on and being a stout-hearted little fellow without much flesh to carry for cobbling did not even in those days bring in a fortune and tom and his folk often had hard times of it he in the course of the morning with a slice out of the afternoon arrived at his destination there thank god he found his sister much better than he might have expected judging from the account he had heard of her and having stayed an hour or two to rest his legs and recruit his stomach with some beef and a pint of ale he set out on his way homeward the way back seemed much longer than it ought to have been and tom cleared the ground very slowly before he had gone far the night closed in but what was that to him for he knew every inch of the road and as to thieves why he had little enough in his pocket to tempt them and if need be and tom was not for his size deficient in courage he had a good stout stick to defend himself with still it was dismal work that tramp through lonely lanes with the trees standing on each side not bright and lively as they had been in the daytime with the sun shining on their leaves and the wind rustling amongst them but drawn up still and dark like sentinels watching in big cloaks the day had closed in with clouds which threatened to make the cobbler's journey more miserable with a downpour of rain but this fortunately kept off and the moon having risen looked out now and then between the clouds and a star or two winked in a style which brought comfort to tom's heart they seemed so companionable so he went on and on till at length he came to the neighbourhood of acton again and glad enough he was once more to find himself in quarters where the very trees and gates and stiles seemed as it were to be old friends tom having been used to the sight of them daily for as many years as had passed since he was born and those were not a few for he was not exactly a chicken well he came at length to the park gates and was hurrying past them for the spot had no particularly good name and he remembered that he had heard some queer tales concerning sights folk had chanced to see there which they would very much sooner have escaped when on a sudden his legs seemed as it were to refuse to stir and with his heart thumping against his ribs as if it would beat away out for itself tom came to a dead stand what was it that he heard it seemed like a rushing and grinding of stones with a cracking like a body of men walking over dry sticks it could not be the wind for there was not a breath stirring and the leaves on the trees lay perfectly still the noise came nearer and nearer and the next thought of tom was that he would like to hide himself in some of the dark shadows around him but his legs would not stir and it was as much as he could do with the aid of his stick to hold himself up on them to make matters worse the moon now just as the cobbler was wishing for darkness broke out from a cloud and cast its light all about him as if with the very object of showing him up it is true the light enabled him to have a good look about him but that was not a thing tom very much cared about just then he stood there a few moments with the sound coming louder and louder till it seemed to be just at hand it was evidently in the park itself now it was at the gate then all of a sudden the gate swung back with a terrible clang and there issued as strange a procession as tom's or indeed mortal's eyes ever set on first 
there came two grooms on horses and then a carriage drawn by four large steeds while two men rode behind they were all goodly-looking men enough and the horses were as tom saw at a glance as pretty pieces of flesh as any man might wish to throw leg across but one thing struck horror to the cobbler's heart as he looked for he saw that none of the horsemen had a head on him on they dashed at a breakneck speed their horses hoofs seeming to dash fire from the stones on the road while the wheels of the coach looked like four bright circles so fast was it drawn over the ground cracking their whips as if to urge the steeds on to even greater speed the men rode on nor did tom hear them utter a word as they swept past him as the coach went by him and his eyes were glued upon it the interior of the carriage seemed to him to be lighted up in some mysterious manner and inside tom said he clearly saw a gentleman and a lady for such they evidently were by their dress sitting side by side but without heads like their attendants another minute and all was gone tom rubbed his eyes and wondered if he had not been asleep but who ever heard of a man falling asleep standing up with no better prop than a stick in his hand he looked at the gates they were closed and fast he looked down the road but could distinguish nothing in the distance however he could hear the sound of as it were a big gust of wind gradually travelling away while all around him was still it did not take him long to get home after that you may be sure and when he told his story though there were some that laughed and hinted that tom was trying to make a hero of himself by pretending that he had seen what no one else of those he told the story to had set eyes on yet the old folk remembered that they themselves had spoken with folk who had seen the very same sight for themselves so i think that tom shanks has the very best claim to be considered the last man in the place who ever witnessed the progress of the spectre coach end of section 12 recording by linda johnson section 13 of folklore and legend english this is a libervox recording all libervox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Arjun Anand. Folklore and Legends, English, by Charles John Tibbet. The Baker's Daughter. A very long time ago, I cannot tell you when. It is so long since there lived in a town, in Herefordshire, a baker who used to sell bread to all the folk around. He was a mean, greedy man, who fought in every way to put money by, and who did not scruple to cheat such people as he was able when they came to his shop. He had a daughter who helped him in his business, being unmarried and living with him, and seeing how her father treated the people, and how he succeeded in getting money by his bad practices. She too, in time, came to do the like. One day, when her father was away, and the girl remained alone in the shop, an old woman came in. My pretty girl, said she, give me a bit of dough, I beg of you, for I am old and hungry. The girl at first told her to be off, but as the old woman would not go, and begged harder than before for a piece of bread, at last the baker's daughter took up a piece of dough, and giving it to her, says, There, now be off, and do not trouble me any more. My dear, says the woman, you have given me a piece of dough. Let me bake it in your oven. I have no place of my own to bake it in. Very well, replied the girl, and taking the dough, placed it in the oven, while the old woman sat down to wait till it was baked. When the girl thought 
the bread should be ready she looked in the oven expecting to find there a small cake and was very much amazed to find instead a very large loaf of bread she pretended to look about the oven as if in search of something i cannot find the cake said she it must have tumbled into the fire and got burnt very well said the woman give me another piece of dough instead and i will wait while it bakes so the girl took another piece of dough smaller than the first piece and having put it in the oven shot to the door at the end of a few minutes or so she looked in again and found there another loaf larger than the last dear me said she pretending to look about her i've surely lost the dough again there's no cake here this pity said the old woman but never mind i will wait while you bake me another piece so the baker's daughter took a piece of dough as small as one of her fingers and put it in the oven while the old woman sat near when she thought it ought to be baked she looked into the oven and there saw a loaf larger than either of the others that is mine said the old woman no replied the girl how could such a large loaf have grown out of a little piece of dough it is mine it is sure said the woman it is not said the girl and you shall not have it well when the old woman saw the saw that the girl would not give her the loaf and saw how she had to cheat her for she was a fairy and knew all the tricks that the baker's daughter had put upon her she draws out from under her cloak a stick and just touches the girl with it then a wonderful thing occurred for the girl became all of a sudden